Good day. We're back to continue our reading of Learning to Fall, The Blessings of an Imperfect Life by Philip Simmons. Today we're on Chapter 5, which is entitled Wild Things. My dog has learned to hunt the mice that live beneath the snow. This is her first winter. She is a long, sleek, black affair, a mixture of various herding breeds. And lacking proper work, she spends her days running the acres of our property, barking at trees, squirrels, and stones, barking at blue sky and clouds and wind, trying to gather her world together and move it towards some fitting destination. Her mouse hunting, too, is an elegant and futile business. With the snow frozen hard, she rears up on her hind legs and brings both front paws down together to punch through the crust. Sometimes she springs into the air to bring greater force to bear on her target. She then thrusts her snout into the hole to sniff out her prey. As far as I know, she'd never caught a thing. For a while, we took all this frantic sniffing and punching and barking at the snow's blank white as just another form of canine folly. But then my eight-year-old son saw some coyotes on television hunting in the same way. So my dog's urge to punch snow must come from somewhere in the ancestral past she shares with her coyote cousins, a behavior uncoiled from some strand of doggy DNA. And when one night I watched a dark, thumb-sized blob of fuzz scoot over the snow before disappearing at the base of our bird feeder pole, I knew she was onto something after all. Once more, I was reminded of how blind I am to the life around me, how unaware of the little things on which my world depends. Among my town's mammals, after all, humans are a small minority. The thousand of us strung out like beads on the mostly dirt roads that thread our 100 square miles of forest, ledge, and swamp. <clears throat> From the mountain peaks at the northern edge of town, you can see little sign of human habitation. Roads, houses, and all but the largest fields are swallowed by trees. The white pinprick of the church steeple in the village center, all that announces our presence to both God and the military fighter jets that practice maneuvers in our airspace. A friend of mine here used to say <clears throat> that he needed to hike these mountains once in a while in order to get small. And you can see what he meant. From the vantage of these peaks, all the works of woman and man, the collective record of our striving, are a pinch of dust thrown on a carpet. That's probably just as well, for I find myself agreeing with Thoreau when he says that a town is saved not more by the righteous men and women in it than by the woods and swamps that surround it. It's a good thing, too, that the animals in our midst seem to find us only a minor inconvenience. Oh, it's true that the animals sometimes inconvenience us, as when the moose lurches into the headlight's beam an event common and dangerous enough to prompt the New Hampshire Fish and Game Department to put out a bumper sticker reading, Break for Moose, it could save your life. Every neighborhood here has its bear, and I'm not the only one to have been awakened at dawn by the dull clang of my metal bird feeder pole being deftly bent to the ground. I suppose I should count it a privilege to descend the stairs in my robe and watch through glass as six feet away one happy adolescent omnivore sits on his haunches, the feeder tipped in his front paws like a tall glass of beer, pink tongue scouring the last seeds from the tube. And I do find it a privilege, as on a recent night, to step out into the cold air with moonlight shining on snow-covered fields and listen to coyotes sing from the edges of a frozen swamp. Wildness is all around us. Going into the woods after a snowfall, I'm startled to see the tracks. Grouse, turkey, rabbit, squirrel, fox, ferret, beaver, bobcat, as though some sort of wildlife convention had been held while I slept. I hope one day to track the mountain lion a friend of mine saw bounding across a paved state road, <clears throat> its first leap taking it to the yellow center line, the next clear across into the woods where it disappeared once more into legend and the night fears of children. <clears throat> the 
Given the abundance of wild things around me, the wonder is that they remain for the most part as invisible as the mice beneath the snow. Sometimes it seems that we live surrounded by wildlife much the way some people believe themselves surrounded by angels. Wild things seem an entire order of life beyond the fringes of ordinary perception. My dog, reminding me coyote fa fashion of this hidden realm, serves as a lesser angel, some intermediary spirit lower on the chain of being, linking me to the wild world. I have come to view her barking at the snow-covered ground as evidence of things unseen. I'm being fanciful, of course, but not entirely. Let's remember that the word animal derives from the Latin anima, or soul. To acknowledge one's own soul, then, is to acknowledge the animal within. And I would argue that to live consciously in the midst of wild things is to live in the midst of soul. How might we understand and deepen our relationship to these two animal realms, to these two soul realms, the wildness within and the wildness without? Thoreau wrote famously that, quote, in wildness is the preservation of the world, end quote. His disciple, John Muir, amended this as, quote, in God's wildness lies the hope of the world, end quote. We see such words on Sierra Club calendars as slogans urging us to preserve the wilderness. I'm less concerned here with land policy and wildlife management than with how we might have a deeper connection to wildness in our daily lives how in becoming more fully wild, we might preserve both our world and ourselves. Mostly we get the wrong idea about wildness. Some of our misuses of the term are innocent enough, as boys hitting a home run in the backyard or sinking a long shot in the driveway hoop. We put on our best staticky sportscaster's voice to say, and the fans go wild. It was the nature of sports fans to go wild. Indeed, going wild might even be the whole point of sports, which give us a time and place in which we can surrender to ecstasy. Sometimes by going wild, we mean merely an impulsive and harmless loosening of restraints when we try a daring new hairstyle or buy the black velvet dress and the lizard skin shoes. We get further off the track when we think of wildness as sexual excess, surrendering to primal impulses. When we think of this sort of wildness, of the wild man or wild woman in each of us, we think of fierce and passionate behavior that is both terrifying and alluring. To call someone an animal can be either a put down as in, you animal, or a come on as in, you animal you. We both desire such wildness and fear it. But we are furthest from the truth when we associate wildness with darkness and evil, where to go wild is to lose control, to give in to violence, to smash windows or bones. <clears throat> it's no secret where wildness got this reputation. Since Plato and Aristotle, we have seen reason as man's defining feature, what sets us apart from animals. And thus we become more human by becoming less animal. Just as biblical tradition grants us humans dominion, quote, over all the wild animals of the earth, end quote, so the human reason of our minds has been granted dominion over the animal instincts of our bodies. We in the West have seen human nature not as an extension of, an extension of animal nature, but as at war with it, and have tried through much of our history to put as much distance as possible between our human and animal selves. Descartes went so far as to claim that animals were essentially machines without mind, emotions, or souls, and therefore <clears throat> utterly different from us. Not until Freud did a Western thinker have the insight and the courage to argue that this denial of our animal natures makes us sick. As civilized men and women, we may build great cities, but we will be unavoidably unhappy in them. If we are to end our war with wildness, we must learn to see it rightly. For our common notions of wildness, savage, ecstatic, excessive, 
have almost nothing to do with the actual wild creatures I see about me. Far from lacking control, the animals I know exemplify it. What you observe most often in wild animals is a quiet but purposeful awareness, an enviable sort of alert calm. Even the ruffled grouse, its brain the size of a cheerio, steps and pecks past my cabin with greater assurance and self-discipline than shown by many folks I know, even on their good days. More often than I like to think, I'd be willing to exchange my anxious, distracted state for that of the red squirrel, whose hectic scrabbling and foraging seems at least driven by a steady purpose and kinetic joy. And savagery? Predators are fierce, but only as they need to be. Humans kill for sport. Animals find sport in less violent pastimes. Predators, after all, spend far less time eating than do their foraging prey, and therefore they are noted layabouts. Lions laze, coyotes yodel, owls sleep late. The hawks that circle above my field are searching for prey, but much of the time they are simply soaring. As for sex, here animals clearly have us beat. Almost all of them have the good sense to want it only at certain times of year. In other seasons, they live free of the tormenting urges that account in one way or another for most of our gross national product. You would think, by the way, that with all our interest in sex, we would enjoy it more than we do. As the poet Howard Nemirov puts it, we think about sex obsessively except during the act when our minds tend to wander. So, Wildness, rightly considered, has its advantages. On the other hand, I realize that living as an animal amounts to more than an extended camping trip. When I was a boy, watching deer flies crawl at the edges of a horse's eyes taught me something of the opportunities for misery this planet afforded. And I have hiked alone deep in grizzly bear country and felt what it was like to be part of the food chain. But somehow it was not until recently that I grasped the basic fact of animals' lives. It happened on one of those days that makes us New Englanders wonder why we don't move to Arizona. 33 degrees <clears throat> and driving sleet. I stood looking out the window at the woods, thinking of deer huddled beneath hemlocks, when suddenly it hit me. Animals actually live outdoors. The moose that wander across our field the deer that peep at us from the forest fringe, are not on some sort of outing. They don't put in their appearances for us, then head back to the locker room for a shower and a change of clothes. Being an animal is a full-time occupation, hazardous and often brief. It's a sad truth that many animals live longer in captivity than they do in the wild. So when I say that we should become more like wild things, I don't mean we should idealize them. <clears throat> we must avoid the Bambi syndrome where all animals become wide-eyed innocents. Those mice tunneling beneath the snow sometimes eat their offspring. And any husband who says of his mate, she'll chew my head off when I get home, should be glad he's not a male praying mantis who suffers this fate quite literally during the most intimate of marital moments. The prejudice that animals and nature are pure, while humans and civilization are corrupt, also has its own rich history. The French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau hatched the idea in the mid-18th century, and from there it swam the English Channel to seize the English Romantic poets, who in turn inspired Emerson and Thoreau, whose writings were tucked into John Murr's backpack on his rambles through Yosemite Valley the accounts of which started modern environmentalism, a movement wherein the idea of nature's uncorrupted in innocence flourishes today. <clears throat> Fact is, animals are neither innocent nor guilty, neither pure nor corrupt, for these are strictly human categories. Indeed, if we're to envy animals, it's precisely because they live outside such categories. And here we come to the heart of the matter. For what would it mean to experience our own actions in such a way that the terms good 
and bad don't apply. It would mean living like animals without doubt as to our life's purpose. It would mean living in such perfect alignment with that purpose that our very act flowed effortlessly from what was highest and truest within us. It would mean rising each day to forage or feed, to shelter and care for our young, to laze or labor, fight or frolic, without distraction, without self-judgment, without taking one step off life's true path. And even in the face of misery and terror, even as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even as the sleet freezes our hides or the hawk descends upon us, it would mean living in the faith that this too is the way. Imagine living in such fashion, and you begin to imagine what I mean by becoming a wild thing. But how to cultivate such a life? Perhaps I'm not the one to try to answer such a question. These days, as my body weakens, I have a hard enough time getting my shirt on in the morning without questioning my life's purpose, without falling prey to the fear and self-judgment that lie in wait for all of us thinking animals, just around the bend from each happy thought. Tottering on the stairs, laboring a quarter of an hour to spread cream cheese on a bagel, I find myself moaning along with William Butler Yeats as he laments his aging body. What shall I do with this absurdity? O oh heart, O oh troubled heart, this caricature, decrepit age that has been tied to me as to a dog's tail. I could console myself by thinking that some of my life's purpose these days is fulfilled by my writing. In my more grandiose moods, I might even imagine that some of my words will live on after my death. Such moments pass, however, and I find myself siding with Woody Allen when he says, I don't want to attain immortality through my work. I want to attain immortality by not dying. So if I say that I'm learning to be a wild thing, you must understand that even on my best days, I am not nearly so wild as I would like. Still, one must make the effort. And I will say that it is in the state of wildness however fleeting, that I find what peace my days afford. But first things first, cultivating your own wildness as much as pole vaulting or the French horn takes practice. That is, you must first have a practice, and then you must practice it. There are many forms such practice can take, but all require that we set aside some part of each day for solitude and silence. For some, this takes the form of meditation or prayer. For others, long distance running does the trick. It could be sitting or walking in the out of doors, or it could be quiet and mindful absorption in a simple task, such as knitting or making bread. By this sort of practice, I don't mean reflection. I don't mean soul searching or analysis or deliberation. In fact, I don't mean thinking of any kind. Our problem, after all, is that we think too much. Thinking has its place, but at some point it becomes a, mean of avoid, a means of avoiding our lives instead of living them. We're after what the great jazz Bill Evans found in common between Japanese ink brush painting and musical improvisation. Each brush stroke, like each note played, cannot be rehearsed, and once laid down, cannot be undone. Direct deed, he writes, is the most meaningful reflection. End quote. In our practice of wildness, as in artistic improvisation, as in life, we must bring all our experience and skill to bear. But what matters most is that we do only the task at hand, that we give ourselves fully to the moment. So in your practice, don't meditate to think about your life. Don't go running to plan your next career move. Don't knit to do something useful while you watch TV. There's nothing wrong, of course, with doing any of these things, but we should not confuse them with the practice of wildness. An accomplished Indian yogi said that, quote, self-observation without judgment 
is the highest spiritual discipline, end quote. It's this quality of awareness, what some call witness consciousness, that we are after. Both the method and the goal of practice are to be fully present to the moment and to ourselves in an attitude of total self-acceptance. Wild animals, of course, don't have to accept themselves. They can simply be. As thinking animals, we must work to create some space for our wild natures, to give them room to roam. Whether keeping our awareness on the breath as we meditate, on our body's rhythm as we run, on our sensations as we sink our hands in bread dough, our practice anchors us in our bodies, takes us further into our wild selves. With time, months, years, decades, lifetimes, would you think this would be easy? Such practice begins to open a space within us. Call it a wildlife preserve, a space where our wild selves can breathe while our judging, criticizing, worrying, doubting minds are kept safely on the other side of the fence. With practice, we find ourselves living more and more inside this preserve, a place we come to recognize as our true home. Our minds, of course, will continue to stand outside the fence, sharing their opinions with us. There you are. You've lit your candles, burned your incense, said your mantra, and now you find yourself in your wildlife preserve. Maybe it's open savanna, a tree-dotted plain with animals grazing, and you find yourself seated beneath a shade tree, a breeze cooling your brow, everything at peace. And meanwhile, there's your other self, your human, civilized self, the one with the sweaty palms, the one with the agenda, standing not far behind the fence saying, you're not doing this right, you know. You've punched down your bread dough and are reshaping the loaf, and there's your mind whispering, your mother-in-law makes better bread. You're into mile four of your run, getting your stride, feeling good, and from outside the fence, a voice points out, that you should have brought the other running suit, the less revealing one, because right now there are people scheduling meetings to discuss your thighs. This is what the mind does, after all. Like my dog who spends her days yapping at snow and trees and sky, the mind wants to feel useful. We cannot silence these voices. They, too, deserve our compassionate acceptance. We can, however, move the fence a little farther out gradually claiming more ground for our wildness until the voices are not so loud, their breath not so hot in our ears. Thoreau said that the most alive is the wildest. We don't go into wildness to escape our lives, but to return to them, to return to our true selves and our highest purposes. In wildness, we live out the Christian injunction to be in the world, but not of it. We find ourselves, as Walt Whitman, quote, both in and out of the game, end quote. Well, let's remember that practice is just that, practice for the rest of our lives. We do not meditate or run or make bread merely to claim an hour's calm from the day's calamity though that in itself has great value. We practice so that we may bring some part of that calm into the remaining hours of the day. We practice wildness so that we may live more fully and constantly in the midst of anima, in the midst of soul. When I have claimed my wildness, I can find myself with Whitman, quote, a plum in the midst of irrational things, end quote. Wildness will not save us from misfortune. Fear, doubt, grief all lie in wait to strike and seize us as before. Only now their grip will not be so tight or last so long. In life's thicket, we will have created a clearing for our wild selves. And in that clearing, in the face of confusion and worry, in the face of failure, and loss in the face of death itself, 
we will lift our noses to the moon and sing. <laughs>